Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to the Net Zero Energy Building Knowledge Series 2020. This is a platform for industry to share their expertise, knowledge, ideas, projects, products, technology, to fuel discussions on energy efficiency and to grow engagements for net zero energy buildings in India. <clears throat> This program is executed under the METRI program supported by USA. METRI is an acronym for Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. METRI supports which are energy efficiency in buildings, sustainable cooling, and training and consumer engagement. This program works in partnership with several organizations to implement various initiatives. The market transformation approach includes creating business opportunities for the private sector, scale up of potential initiatives, enabling policies, as well as providing training for NSM. METRI is supporting efforts moving towards a super efficient and net zero energy target for buildings in India. The NZEV Knowledge Portal is a one-stop site for information on NZs and you may explore this further on the website nzeb.in. This knowledge series aims to help you gain insights about energy efficiency, NZs, and sustainability at large. The title of today's webinar, Cooling Without Air Conditioning, it's quite intriguing, isn't it? Energy efficiency and comfort are correlated. A transformative approach to design and technology is required to move away from the business as usual to achieve sustainability. Our expert panel today will take a fresh look at the need for thermal comfort in commercial buildings. We are really proud to have the Gubbi group with us today to present today's session. I would like to first introduce Dr. Vinod Gupta. He's the alumnus of School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi and Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Dr. Gupta has been a teacher in architecture and industrial design at SCA Delhi. He is partner in Space Design Consultants and CEO of Opus Indigo Designs Private Limited, Fellow of the Indian Institute of Architects, member of Institute of Indian Interior Designers, founder member of Gubbi Alliance for Sustainable Habitat, and founder member of Griha Council. He continues to be associated with SPA Delhi and Sushant School of Art and Architecture and Sushant School of Design in different capacities. Vinod Gupta's contribution has been in environment-friendly architecture and interior design, furniture design, sustainable planning and design, intelligent smart buildings as well. His current work focuses on sustainable design for educational campuses and ergonomics of furniture for work. He designs and manufacture, manufactures ergonomic furniture and accessories. Over to you, Mr. Gupta, to take the session further. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, welcome, everyone. I have several duties to perform here. The first of them is to talk about Gubbi, 
the Gurbi Alliance for Sustainable Habitat is a self-funded association of habitat professionals and researchers that seeks to maintain to mainstream sustainability as a core concern in design, policy, and habitat management. Gurbi came into being with a workshop near Bangalore in 2008. Among its 20 members spread across the country are pioneers and leading Indian practitioners of genuinely sustainable approaches in architecture, construction, and participatory rehabilitation. The word Gubbi means sparrow in Kannada, and Doda Gubbi was the place where it started. Today, sustainable has become a buzzword that means different things to different people. It has also become another way in which market interests are promoted. Gubbi believes that we need to develop an, an approach to sustainability that is consistent just anchored in human and ecological survival, plural and critical. To do this, architecture needs to be conscious, architecture needs to consciously embrace values related to sufficiency, that is reducing consumption and questioning demand, justice, resilience, equity and cultural identity. For Gubbi, the challenge of sustainability offers the possibility of architectural innovation that goes beyond the narrow formal and technical pursuits ruling over the architectural imagination today. Real innovation may be based on traditional wisdom and materials, modern scientific knowledge, advanced technology, or very often a combination of all these three, all, all these factors. Gubi recognizes that the social and technical challenges that must be overcome to a significantly more sustainable architecture are serious. But it believes that the will and the creativity to meet these challenges does exist. To catalyze dialogue that will help this process grow, Gubi has organized various activities and platforms, including a website available uh, and a YouTube channel on which conversations for shaping a better future can be conducted. Gubi organizes its members and other interested participants on specific themes in different parts of the country. This webinar is the first of such events to be organized to organize. We shall share with all the attendees of this webinar the links for the website, uh, the YouTube channel, and publications of Gubi Alliance for Sustainable Habitat. Now, this particular seminar or, or webinar on cooling without air conditioning uh, is rooted in what we see going on around us today. Uh, it is uh, air conditioning has been one of the fastest growing industries in the last decade. The rising air temperatures, air pollution, and noise in cities has made air conditioning a must for all kinds of buildings and climates. Just as a car without air conditioning is not considered good enough, urban buildings are also not considered complete without air conditioning. But just as there are many other modes of transport where air conditioning is neither used nor expected, there are many ways of living without air conditioning, even though the availability of relatively inexpensive standalone air conditioning units has made air conditioning ubiquitous. There are six different climatic regions in India and not all of them need cooling or heating. But the problems of air pollution and noise in cities require a response and air conditioning is the universal technology used today. There were many different passive and active technologies available in the past, but they lost out to air conditioning because they could not deal with air quality, temperature and humidity all at the same time. They were however suitable for providing thermal comfort in specific conditions at a fraction of the cost of air conditioning. For a long time now, we have discussed that air conditioning uses a great deal of energy, more than what we as a society can afford, and the green building movement was focused on reduction in energy consumption in buildings. We now stand at a watershed because we realize that air conditioning contributes to the spread of airborne infectious diseases like COVID-19. Experts tell us that naturally ventilated buildings without air conditioning are better at this time. Air pollution in winter months is one of those times when air conditioning fails us also. Warmer temperatures and more humidity, the hallmarks of some of the other technologies, are actually considered less infectious. 
we are at a point when we can look at the needs for cooling and air quality control and decides the most appropriate technology in preference to air conditioning. Apart from energy, cooling also consumes water. While India has plenty of solar energy available, we need to be careful with the use of water. The spread of COVID-19 requires us to relook at air conditioning of large buildings like offices, hospitals, and hotels and airports. Many people have spoken about this, about that, and this webinar is not going to deal with this subject. Cooling without air conditioning will take a fresh look at the need for thermal comfort in offices, smaller offices, retail stores, restaurants, schools, colleges, and residences, and the different ways in which this can be taken care of from building design to internal layouts, materials, and finishes. It will also look at the different technologies that have been proven in the past and that may have become more relevant in the context of the outbreak of COVID-19. Cooling without air conditioning will also discuss ways of measuring the efficacy of cooling systems. The speakers are Ashok Lal, Sanjay Prakash, Tanmay Tathagat, and G.C. Morgan. Professor Ashok Lal uh, graduated from the University of Cambridge, uh, UK, in architecture, fine arts, and obtained the Architectural Association Diploma in 1970. After working in different parts of the world, Ashok established his architectural firm in 1981, and uh, I met him soon after this for the first time. His, his architectural practice is based on principles of environmental sustainability and social responsibility that can be seen in all his works, large and small. Since 1990, he has been engaged in architectural education and has helped establish, uh, and helped establish the TVB School of Habitat Studies that eventually became the University School of Architecture and Planning in Delhi. He has made a significant contribution to the development of curricula and teaching methods for architectural education. Ashok has won many architectural competitions and awards, and his work has been published widely. He is actively engaged in developing affordable housing projects today. What sets him apart from others is the scientific and the philosophical rigor that he brings to his professional work. Ashok has worked closely with Development Alternatives and the Energy Resources Institute and his buildings, designs for these institute set many standards for sustainable design in buildings. He has contributed to the development of GREHA, the Green Building Rated System. Uh, the next speaker is Sanjay Prakash. He's a graduate from SPA of 1980. This is where I met him first, and this is where he produced an outstanding thesis on environment-friendly architecture. He has worked with passive and low energy architecture, hybrid air conditioning, autonomous energy and water systems, bamboo and earth construction, and community-based design of common property. Sanjay likes to call himself a building technologist because he deals with so many different aspects of technology in buildings. He works as a catalyst, training his associates to develop skills in areas of work, in the areas of work, and launch their own enterprises. Sanjay likes to collaborate with other people and has a, worked uh, a, with a very large number of design teams from all around the world. He has been a visiting teacher at SPA and many other schools as well. His iconic buildings, there are many buildings that he has designed in many campuses, but the, a few buildings in Delhi, two of them, are the iconic buildings. One is the Matighar at Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts and Mirambika School at Aurobindo Ashram in Delhi. Both these buildings are supposed to go away at some time, uh, but these are, you know, very fine pieces of architecture uh, of sustainable kind. He heads his design firm called the Studio for Habitat Futures. Uh, in fact, the dealing with future is one of Sanjay's uh, Thing that he wants to do today. He's co-founder of the Future Institute and the uh, Himalayan Institute for Alternatives in Ladakh. He's also a senior advisor to the Indian Institute of Human Settlements in Bangalore. 
The third speaker is Tanmay Tathagat, uh, bachelor of, uh, from SP in 1993. Tanmay got his master of science in buildings, uh, building design from Arizona State University in Tempe. Tanmay has worked uh, has working experience in projects dealing with sustainable development, building energy efficiency, green buildings, and energy efficiency standards and labeling in Asia, Africa, and the US. He has made significant contribution to the development of LEED India and GRIHA green building rating system and has led the development of energy conservation building board in India. His international experience includes support to energy efficiency and green building code development in California, India, Thailand, Philippines, Nigeria, Cape Verde, and Vietnam. He leads Environmental Design Solutions, a well-known consultancy for climate change policies, energy efficient building design, building code development, energy efficiency policy development, energy simulation, and green building certification process. Tanmay has extensive experience in green building design, energy simulation, architectural and mechanical design, and green building certification process. The fourth speaker is uh, G.C. Modgill. He is a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering from Thapan Institute of Engineering and Technology, Patiala. He pioneered the art of thoughtful, eco-friendly design in association with many well-known architects. He founded Sterling India Consulting Engineers in 1990. He has provided innovative design and integrated approach to engineering services for institutional buildings, hotels, hospitals, airports, SEZs, IT parks, corporate offices, diplomatic missions, and residential complex. And, and these stand tall as testimony to his engineering excellence in the profession. He is a senior fellow of ASHRAE and ISHRAE. He has contributed to the development of the National Building Code 2005 and the revision to it in 2016. He was always also involved in the Energy Conserving Building Code, originally propagated in 2007 and later in, revised in 2017. And he has been part of the GRIHA Green Building Rating System development. He has been a member of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency Committee on Chiller Standards and also a member of the industry team for building energy efficiency project. He is a member of the panel for space conditioning under FLCTD, UNIDO, and BEE. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I would request Ashok, uh, Professor Ashok Lal, to start first. And do I talk about maybe just a second? The Ashok is going to talk about the need for thermal comfort in different regions of India. Sanjay will talk about the techniques for managing cooling loads in buildings. Tanmay is concerned about the metrics for thermal comfort versus metrics for air conditioning. And he will also talk about the change requirements in the context of COVID-19. Uh, GC Modgil will talk about the, all the low energy cooling systems, the hybrid systems and so on, and explain to us how these can be used in buildings today. Welcome. Sanjay, sorry, Ashok, please start. Thank you. Um, I'll work my way to the beginning of my show, slideshow. Just give me a moment. Right, so welcome everyone. Uh, the way I thought I would deal with this rather complex subject about the need for air conditioning in different regions for different purposes and so on, by asking the question, what is the culture of air conditioning? And because it's a, it's a nice story and it gives us some sort of a depth of understanding of how our dependence on air conditioning um, as a facility that we are now getting 
beginning to consume more and more, has grown over the years, where it starts and how, where we are today. And we can also see some of the trends. I try to do it in very simple terms, non-technical, non-quantitative, but simple stories. That's what I want to do. So as Vinod has already said that um, um, because of COVID-19, there is now greater fear of transmittance of viral infections. And of course, you expect it to be more of a problem where you have circulating air in trapped spaces, trapped air in shared spaces where everybody is working together or doing things together. That's one serious concern. And it suggests that you'll become even more dependent on more refined, more powerful air conditioning system. But why should we be worried about air conditioning system? Why should we be at all worried about it? And in the introduction you heard, and we know this also touched on it, that the problem is that air conditioning technology, the way it is now available to us, is a big energy guzzler. It is one of the crucial contributors to climate change. And typically, 70% of energy consumption in buildings when you become dependent on it is what is to be seen. This is just a diagram that I hope to develop as we go through this talk. Uh, it looks at air condition comfort as something which stands in the middle. And around it are three issues. One of lifestyle, perhaps the most important one. Another one of physiology, which is the relationship between the body and its environment. And the third one of economics, a bit more complex and a bit difficult to understand. And I start with this picture of Jatin Das, an artist who's got this fantastic collection of um, fantastic collection of fans. And as you can see, now where am I? Uh, <laughs> I've lost my picture. We can see it. You can see it. Yeah, right, but I've I've lost lost my own um, this thing on the screen. So just a minute. Let me get back to it. Okay. Where did show screen? Oh. Uh, what's happened is that my my own picture is covering my screen. So let me just see if I can get out of that. Right, maybe this is one. Yeah, we are back to it. So another thing is that the need for cooling the body is something that we've realized since kingdom come. One, one is feeling uncomfortable, one wants to do something about it. And one of the first inventions uh, when just by uh, removing your clothing or adjusting your clothing or space, you couldn't get enough comfort, you resorted to a hand fan. And it was such a natural invention. You fan your face when you need it. But there's a problem. You need a hand to do it with, and, it, and you can use it really at times of rest and leisure. And this is a kind of a behavioral adaptation. Trying to move to the next. Ah. And of course, this gave rise to a beautiful and rich culture of artifacts, which evolved over centuries, uh, organic adaptive design. It's uh, one of the best ways of describing good design, where the mind, the body, and the tool that you use are like a continuum. There's no awkwardness about it. It's absolutely natural for you to use. And something beautiful comes out of it when you do that. Um, and now this is something which is common to this entire region. So this allusion to culture is really about, generally speaking, 
the warm climates. There are parts of the of this subcontinent where in the north you will find that there is a cold season too, and then there are northern parts which are even very cold. But by and large, it is about the problem of getting cooled when the weather is hot. And here we have a natural adaptation in dress that you can see. It's very it can be very fashionable. It is extremely functional. It can be used for religious duties, and it can um, become something which is adjusted when when you put on some more clothes, when you go for formal affairs, and then finally you move away from your natural adjustment of clothing to retain pools when symbolism becomes more important. And here again, uh, you of course here it's an air conditioned environment, but uh, everybody is, is following a certain kind of dress code irrespective of location or weather. And only our prime minister here is making a point that yes, you know, I have my own dress code and it is probably a little bit more climate friendly. But this is one of the things that symbolism begins to override the adaptation to comfort. And even in diet, of course, a sharbat is something that is drunk in warm seasons to produce cools. It is an adaptive technology. It brings cools inside your body. And when you couldn't do it within your body and you had some assistance, you started deploying this kind of fan. Very good signal here. That movement of air was one of the adaptations. Encouraging movement of air was one of the adaptations that made you feel more comfortable. And then, of course, electricity arrived, and we had the electric fan. Um, this is in the early 19th century. And once this came, my gosh, the world started changing. And this is what I'm enjoying right now. My temperature is around 29 degrees Celsius. And my wet bulb temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, which means that the relative humidity is around 55%. And I've got a fan above me, and I'm really very comfortable right now. So I'm in a pre-air conditioning age, enjoying comfort. There's the guy who's responsible for it all, Mr. Carrier. And it was in 1902 that he first installed a commercial machine that would pump heat from inside a space to the outside while circulating the air, uh, keeping certain properties of the air which are conducive here to a manufacturing unit. A lithographic and publishing company uses this. It is for a workspace and a production space. And it is only 1952 that this becomes a commercially widely available. And that is when the White House gets centrally air conditioned. Until then, as you can see in the picture on the left, big awnings to keep you shaded. And once the air conditioning came in, the awnings disappeared. Funny things, but that's what happened. And of course, this is the start of the culture of control indoor environments for collective activities. This now begins to grow very rapidly, starts in the United States, spreads across the rest of the world as it begins to, um, the development occurs. And then eventually, ironically, reaches Europe too. But with the expansion of this engineering, uh, standards needed to be set. And Mr. Fanger was the first man to do some research. And he developed what is now called a thermal comfort model, which is based on looking at the human body as a standard, uh, a universal uh, metabolism, which needs to maintain a certain internal balance vis-a-vis -vis the outside, and he came up with certain comfort standards. And these comfort standards, which is that, you know, that 23 degrees centigrade and the, the popular or the mean vote, how many people say you're okay at this temperature, how many, how many people say you're okay at that temperature, he established that kind of method of doing things and came up with standards. And this became spread like wildfire across the air conditioning industries. Mr. Modgul will tell us that we just followed it blindly, and this went on for years and years and years. Until 
very much later, Nicol and Humphreys, both from the UK. Um, well, UK, ancient colonial country, they had some links across the globe. They went tra tripsing across Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and so on, and, and Indonesia. And then they did surveys about when do people when do people feel comfortable? At what point should they feel comfortable? Is Mr. Fanger right? And my gosh, they came to another another understanding that there is something called an adaptation of comfort. And they tried to understand and to publish this paper called Understanding the Adaptive Approach to Thermal Comfort. It's basically saying that if you are living in a cold place, you'll get used to the cold and you'll be quite comfortable at fairly low temperatures. If you are living in a very hot place, you'll get used to the heat and you'll feel comfortable at fairly high temperatures. So there's a very broad range within which you can feel comfortable and you, you will adapt to it. And then, of course, when this theory became well established, when this knowledge became well established, someone had to move the air conditioning industry. And here are two real stalwarts, Richard De Deere and Gail Breger, working in America and persuading ASHRAE, my gosh, the most conservative of all associations. They persuaded them to accept the adaptive comfort standard model. And they developed it into a science. And here's a diagram that explains what the science is, but they didn't quite win the whole battle because this was accepted only for naturally ventilated spaces, not for air conditioned spaces. The battle wasn't quite won, but good progress there. And this has been followed up recently in India uh, with Rajan Rewal uh, Rawal leading, leading a team at SEPT University doing a similar study for the Indian situation and finding yet another uh, adaptive comfort standard for India and Indian commercial buildings. So there is such a thing as an adaptive response to discomfort, and it could be physiological, that means your metab metabolism will adjust, and it can be behavioral, that means you might do something about it. You might switch on a fan, you might open a window, you might sit on a swing, um, you might go to Shimla, and so on and so forth. You might do many things, to, and you might move into the shade or go into the breeze, and so on. And the range is very wide, something like 17, 18 degrees at the bottom to beyond 35, up to 36 degrees at the top. It is below this and above this, if you're exposed to these conditions, then perhaps thermal stress actually tells on your body significantly. But till then, you might be okay. But at the same time, what happens? Symbolism. Symbolism, remember that word, overrides adaptive responses. Here we are. My God, to be well dressed to go to school, wear a necktie, clothes collar, stockings, boys and girls. Seniors, if you want to be a true professional, this is your standard dress, irrespective of weather. You know, I've seen in Sri Lanka. Salespeople wearing a jacket in the sweltering heat, sweating profusely, putting on the jacket and a necktie, coming to sell some odd thing or the other to your house. It's crazy, but symbolism seems to override adaptive strategies that you'd naturally adopt. And there was a time, I mean, this was our time, all of us, our generation, our time, when we sat all our exams, in spaces that were not conditioned. And many of us did pretty well. I mean, I didn't do so well, but many of us did pretty well. And they, you know, Sanjay and all scored enormous marks and their performance was not affected. And they worked in these non-air conditioned circumstances, but they had the ceiling fan, I think, as to their advantage there. And of course, markets, as we have seen, have traditionally wanted to be open. The shops have wanted to be open. And even now, many, many shops are open to all season in this way. But what are we seeing? We are seeing that as we move up to serve the wealthier gang, um, if it's jewelry, if it's fashion, if it's mobiles, and if it's high heel shoes, well, the shopkeepers say, 
that if you have it air conditioned, you'll sell more. And now, so air conditioning now is following the commerce for the wealthy. And it seems to be making very strong inroads over here. And not that surprisingly, um, in my days, it was impossible to hear of you know, a school, a riot, you know, being air conditioned space. Just not a, it was just not on. It was not necessary at all. Because, of course, you took holidays during the worst months of the year, you know, and you adjusted your school timings according to reasonable times of early morning or early parts of the day or um, for summers and so on. But here we are, schools are now offering air conditioned comfort. And of course, university and colleges too. But you know, all of this is part of cities. And as Vinod pointed out, as Vinod pointed out so emphatically, as the cities grow with all this commerce and institutions and crowdedness and development, the space outside in the city is getting, becoming more and more hostile, whether it is mosquitoes or flies, whether it is pollution or noise. And all you want is peace and quiet indoors. And you want to build your fortress. You want to live inside your fortress. And well, this is, is an invitation to the dependence on air conditioning systems. And when you multiply it plot after plot after plot, building after building after building, what you get is a city which is hostile in every environmental sense with buildings that are seeking to become fortresses with controlled environments inside. And as they become fortresses with controlled environments inside, they guzzle a lot of energy and they pump that heat that they utilize for keeping themselves comfortable out into the outer space. They pump it out into the outer space. And this is what happens. That high density, intensive development kind of city is equal to pollution, and the urban heat island effect with rising temperatures. So here is an important thing to recognize, that the march of air conditioning or the depending, dependence on indoor controlled environments delivered by air conditioning technology has a great deal to do with the way we configure our activities and we develop our cities, a great deal to do with that. And of course, it's win-win for the air conditioning industry. They come around and they say, well, as we've seen, air conditioning gives you the power to increase sales, to enhance performance, even to increase productivity and control indoor air quality, ensure health, no thermal stress, stress. And at the bottom on the left-hand side, you see a picture of Lee Kuan Yew, who was the Prime Minister of Singapore, who saw Singapore become a developed nation in just a decade and a half or two decades. And he said that the technology, the one technology that is responsible for the rapid development of Singapore is air conditioning technology. Very interesting. That's what he says. But on the right-hand side, you'll see some pictures these are pre-air conditioning spaces or spaces where air conditioning has not yet come in, where some people are engaged in activities which are extremely fine and delicate and require a lot of concentration and very high precision and other activities that also require precision, but they also need some physical exertion. And all this was done to very high standards. So I do not know whether air conditioning itself is responsible for higher performance and higher productivity. I'm not sure about that. And when it comes to intellectual performance or quality of thought and how you can move so many people with quality of thought, we have a gentleman on the right-hand side at the bottom uh, working from Sevagram, which is not air conditioned, and moving the world. So here's some question about, you know, put to the claims of the air conditioning industry here. So I just give you a quick example of an environmental fortress built in an industrial area. Uh, it's an industrial plot. And in this plot, there are three parts. There's an office building, there's a there's a workshop, a workshed, 
And alongside the workshed, there are there's a canteen, there are some other offices and stores that are alongside it. And what happens here is that the office building gets the highest level of comfort. There's a lot of quite a lot of money is spent on it, very highly integrated design, very efficient, of course, and all of that, but still, if it's supposed to be like class A. And the ancillary spaces to the industrial shed, where there's a canteen and few other offices and training, uh, training rooms and classrooms and so on, that gets class B. Uh, split units, ceiling fans, and perhaps not that degree of control, certainly not that degree of air quality control. And then you get class C, the industrial shed, shed where actually most people are working, where there's, there's filtered fresh air, washed, filtered fresh air wafting through the space, principally for the machinery, not so much for the workers. But this is class A conditioning, class B conditioning, and class C conditioning. And in Australia, the engineers actually established these three classes, or I don't know whether it was done for elsewhere also. There are three classes of conditioning that have been established. And you can, according to the type of use, you can go for one class or the other. But Richard the Deer went on some research and he said, well, you know, what you find is that whether it is class A or class B or class C, when you ask people, are you comfortable? In each of the classes of buildings, about 80% say that they are quite comfortable enough, and about 20% will say they're not comfortable, even if they're in class A or in class C or class B. So what are these standards about? What is it all about? And he delivered a beautiful paper at CLIA conference some time ago, where he argued and he showed this, there's some research done, that thermal delight, or what is called anesthesia, must be an integral part of architectural delight too. And what is required for thermal delight is that it requires change and variation in sensation or in sensory experience to feel alive and to feel active. So again, here's a good question for our air conditioning standards people. Well, the promise is that you can get to world class. And here is the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation building in Mumbai, designed like a solar cooker, and then converted into a refrigerator. World class. Symbolism. Another symbolism. A symbolism of ethical transparency. That's why we have glass, because transparency is ethical. And whose building is this? It is the building of the Central Bureau of Investigation, their headquarters in New Delhi. Symbolism. Amazing. And what do the people say? What do the uh, sellers of air conditioning say? They say, we can convert your design or a solar cooker, which you may do, into a cool refrigerator. We have the technology if you have the money. That's their promise. And so the promise of air conditioning, combined with the promise of the glass industry, gave license to the creative imagination of the designer for every kind of indulgence without care for the impact on the environment. I'm really happy to say that now this whole thing is now turning around. And once again, I think more and more designers are thinking deeply about how the design decisions they take have an important have an have an impact on the environment. There's another important sociological fact, and that is where leadership in design imagination is extremely important. In all iniquitous societies, where there are some people who are very powerful and very rich, and those who are not so powerful and so rich, there is a desire for us to emulate those we consider to be wealthier and more powerful. And it is for this reason that the moment a young, young person, an entrepreneur wants to set up an IT industry, he immediately says, oh, it must look like the Google office, or it must look like something else, but it looks like that symbolism takes over because they seek to emulate those whom they consider to be wealthier and more powerful. And so, 
here is the, the diagram we started with, kind of summarized and elaborated a bit more. On the side of economics, you have the question of productivity and performance, which I think needs to be questioned more whether air conditioning really is the key for all of that. And there is also the cost of cooling technology. Air conditioning still, although it is becoming cheaper, is still quite an expensive technology. And of course, um, it is also uh, harmful for the environment. And on the side of physiology, you need to take ad advantage of the potential of acclimatization. And on lifestyles, there's a whole lot of things. As you move towards adaptation, whether it is physical, physiological adaptation or behavioral adaptation, you go towards the cooler end, the greener end of sustainability. And as you move from impossible dread course codes, which are somehow considered to be driven by notions of modesty and the symbolisms of dress, and this whole thing of being cool as being really cool, you know, it's kind of uh, a class statement. And the idea of control and wealth being represented by air conditioning, you go further and further away from energy efficiency and environmental responsibility. So the question really, the big question is, to what extent is air conditioning a necessity? And to what extent is it really just a desire? Remember, how you work out your cities is going to be key. Thank you for your attention. Now, I'd like to hand over to Sanjay, who's going to speak next. Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. I, I, OK. So um, there, I think this should be possible for everybody to see my screen. OK. Um, I'm going to take over from Ashok, and it's wonderful to have such a good uh, speaker at the very beginning because it allows you to um, think out uh, it, it's the mood, as it were. But as a practitioner, what happens is that we come across many people who say we are not Gandhi. We can't stay in a non air conditioned environment. So, so this partly that is due to addiction. But partly it is due to, uh, you know, not really thinking out what priorities in human life are. So uh, what we've noticed is that we don't like to design cities that have a better microclimate. Uh, it's possible to actually design better buildings provided you have, um, you know, an environment which is cooler to begin with. So more trees or uh, uh, more vegetation and so on, that, that itself would matter. So now when we had to design this uh, IIT Jodhpur campus, we worked out certain terms and how they would shade from the hot winds um, and therefore create a cooler environment for the entire settlement. And then we put the settlement in a bundled up form within the, within the berms. So that was it. We've done a similar technique in um, uh, this new consulate of India in Jeddah, where we've made courtyards uh, in a way that are self-shading, and many of them have. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, what did I? Do? Okay, many of them have a courtyard, which uh, have uh, in some cases cooling devices like sprays and so on, and a lot of drip irrigation with trees and greenery so as to create an overall cool ambience within which the building is placed. Remember, a lot of practitioners aims is not to eliminate air conditioning, but to ensure that it is mostly done with fresh air, which is very expensive if you do it 100% fresh air, of course, and uh, all the time, and or to reduce the number of days that you require it dramatically, meaning instead of 100 days, 200 days in the year, if you require it for only 10 or 15 days, then that's still some kind of a saving. So that has been, as a practitioner, some of the approaches that we've taken. And um, I think this was demonstrated to some extent in this building, which uh, you could say is a sort of adaptive comfort building 
Um, just a minute. I think I keep shuffling between. Yeah. Uh, could everybody see the basic picture all the time, or is it flipping between a reduced view and a full view? <laughs> You can see uh, anyway, I... the news view right now and the okay. full view and your your webcam is switched off. Is switched off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fine. So um so uh, basically this building, the Terry Retreat building in Gualpadi near uh, Delhi. Uh was, you can't see uh, the, the screen right now. Oh yes, now, now it's on. Oh, now it's on. Funny. Yes, now it's on. Is that better? Yeah, this is better. OK, fine. Thank you. So uh, this building, the Terry Retreat building, is a hostel for 30 people, and it's cooled by uh, what we might call an earth tunnel system, which basically consists of uh, fresh air being drawn in this case, 70 meters underground, four meters underground, and just pumped into the space. Now, it's true that using this kind of method, which is basically a kind of um, a surrogate for something like a basement, which is which keeps warm in the winter and cool in the summer, it's true that you can't achieve 25 plus minus one, which is what air conditioning claims to do it's right i mean air conditioning mechanical air conditioning at a huge energy cost can give you practically any temperature of your choice but it's true that uh, this can't happen with these natural systems but this building for example as far as i know has not gone above 30.8 centigrade in any room uh, when in use over the last uh, what 30, 30 years since it was made. And therefore, I think it makes sense to look at the adaptive kind of systems that Ashok has been talking about and being able to look at the fact that if you switch on ceiling fans and if you accept larger temperature swings, in my case, I think of it as 25 plus minus five, then you have a fairly comfortable space as long as you do the classical things which are supposed to be done in passive architecture. And what are those? Uh, let me say, besides the microclimate, which is of course important, you need to orient your building well. This particular building is oriented south so that you don't get summer sun and you get a lot of winter sun for the warmth. This is Delhi, so you get some uh, winter as well. You need to shade it. Uh, especially the windows because the glass can be a source of extreme heat. You need to use the right colors. Uh, so you have this uh, rather light colored grid that you see here, as well as some dark colored grid for those parts that required uh, air to be heated up and go up into those chimneys. So you see that combination of color and you have insulation as well this particular building has uh, external insulation that's very useful because what happens with external insulation is that uh, uh, We shall be back in a few moments. Uh, I'm sorry, I. I have some problem with my system, but any case, let me continue. So uh, external insulation, well, insulation is of really two types actually. 
so uh, we think of insulation as lightweight insulation like glass wool or thermocol and stuff like that and that is insulating but basically doesn't delay any uh, time from the time that it comes from outside to inside the heat wave kind of comes at the same time or with very little very few minutes of difference but there is another kind of insulation which in electrical terms let me tell you those who are electrically oriented will understand instead of resistance which is what uh, thermocol type insulation is you can have mass that is to say a uh, capacitance so you have the ability in certain materials like stone and brick to absorb a lot of the heat for much of the day and sure it will radiate it in the night but it highly ameliorates the difference of temperature that is outside maybe 15 degrees may become 5 degrees inside and then the time is changed so that what is available outside as the peak heat probably at 3 pm comes inside at uh, let's say 9 or 10 pm in the night and you can open the windows at that time and change the whole system now i say open the windows it's important to understand that if you don't do anything to change the building or the configuration over the day or night uh, you will get no change here let me show you the next slide what's happening hmm. okay so if you don't change the uh, this can be seen there's a graph here yeah okay so this is a graph of the temperature variations on an average day in these 12 months of the year in the city of in one city in central india and this tells you well this is typically three seasons right there's a cold season then there are uh, in march april may it's a dry heat then there is a warm humid season where the temperatures don't drip, uh, drop so much but the variation between uh, wet bulb and dry bulb reduces and finally the cold weather sets in typically after diwali in in india so um, so basically if you have mass insulation it's excellent for reducing variations of inside and outside and if you don't change any configuration of the building of course the average outside temperature will be the average inside temperature because there's a basic law of physics which says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed right and that means that if you don't do anything to the building you will get the average energy outside equal to the average energy inside otherwise something is getting created or destroyed and that normally with the air conditioning system that is what they are saying that we are actually pumping the heat back out into the environment by temporarily overheating the refrigerant and so on now if you don't do that and if you don't have any mechanical devices and you don't change the configuration of the building you will get average inside temperatures which may not be very comfortable so instead of that uh, it is very useful to have something like a night purge ventilation that is to say when temperatures are cooler in the night you open the windows and strongly ventilate the system that way and especially if you have mass insulation that is to say inside you um, reduce the temperature of the rooms and store that cooled as it were in the walls then till 12 or 1 o'clock you will not need to switch on any air conditioning in order to keep within comfort level even if you ignore the aspect of lifestyle even if you say that okay i'm not gandhi and i require 25 plus minus well i'm not going to say 25 plus minus 1 mm -hmm. which is what air conditioning industry would like you to do but i'm going to say 25 plus minus 5 is a completely and perfectly valid and acceptable range and believe me 25 degree if that's a target for air conditioning also it would take a lot more energy to keep temperatures to 25 and 25 plus minus 1 and a lot less on a lot fewer days to keep it at 25 plus minus 5 even if you went mechanically uh, i have the next slide yeah uh, SP, your slides are not advancing. Uh, is, can is we this, go full screen? Yeah, just a minute. Is this uh, seen now? 
this is a white slide or um, no this is the uh, we see the on the telephone. Oh, I'm afraid I was bumped out by my system and I'm not being able to get in again. Well, let me, is this any better? I, I'll uh, just. No. Yeah, can you uh, make it possible for me to share my screen? Because yes. I think that would be done again. Mm -hmm. You should be able to do this now. Yeah, there you are. Now better? Well, it'll take okay. a few seconds. Yeah, so you can see the nickel graph for the Tehran. Yes, we can see that now. Okay, so uh, this is the Fergus nickel graph, which is something that uh, Ashok introduced. Uh, thank you for that, Ashok. Fergus nickel, after doing all his work in Iran and Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and so on, and Indonesia worked out that human beings are not necessarily more comfortable at 23 or 24 or 22 plus minus one as their conditioning industry would like you to believe but they're actually more comfortable the warmer the outside temperature is so if this graph the thick black line you can see in january 19 is comfortable and in july uh 29 or something like that is comfortably so this is an important finding and we need to start adopting this adaptive system of conditioning uh, i know of one building which has a different set point in the morning a different set point in the afternoon and nobody really complains it is a conditioned building but uh, it's a very low energy compared to a regular flat uh, standard of comfort. Look at how this uh, changes when uh, clothing comes into the picture. So that has also been studied as a science. So um, I'm sorry. Okay. Can this clothing graph be seen now? Deepa, can you help me? Yes, yes, yes. You okay. can see this. So uh, uh, we have in classrooms typically people wear lighter clothes even though ashok showed some pictures of how uh, formal formally dressed school children with ties and stockings go to certain kinds of schools in india but in classrooms children generally wear lighter clothes and therefore the kind of clothing insulation the clow factor as it is called changes and you see how Comfort can be achieved at various temperatures, all the way from 21 to 26 C, depending on how you are dressed. So this is an aspect of lifestyle change, and lifestyle change comes in many flavors. So Ashok already showed how it comes in diet, in the form of uh, non-spicy food when you want to keep cool, uh, water or sherbets, clothes, which I am looking at now, and a calm mind, which also was shown in the form of uh, the monks who were meditating, right? Well, this particular building that I'm showing you now uh, is called the Tapasya Ashram and Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi. And I know quite a few of you will say, oh, I'm not Gandhi. But the fact is that there are large numbers of people, as many as 500, who live in this building. And this is not an air-conditioned building. And I can vouch for the fact that despite the fact that I am kind of addicted to air conditioning at home, I've stayed in this building for a an year and a half and managed happily without air conditioning. Yes, I had to adjust slightly my, my diet, adjust slightly my sleeping time. Um, you know, in the summer, it would be late in the evening by the time I would be cool enough to go to sleep and so on. But it wasn't an uncomfortable experience on the whole. So this for me represents one kind of an approach towards the sufficiency of cooling without air conditioning by using a light color, by using insulation, by using the correct orientation of these windows, by ensuring that the sunlight does not come into these rooms, 
with good adequate ventilation, with courtyards and so on. We have designed formal buildings, if I may call formal buildings. This is a building in Manesar, which is a commercial office building. And in this also, there are possibilities which you will see in the diagram on the right and you will see the AHUs on the left. Now the AHUs on the left seem to be like windows, but they are actually look like blank windows. Now these are not blank windows, they are AHU rooms. And the reason why they are like that is because these are large filters. And why are they large filters? Because this building has been designed for 100% fresh air. Now, it's not as if it's 100% fresh air all the time. It goes from a variable 10% fresh air to 100% fresh air, depending on what the outside temperature is. So if you were to reset, this is right now set for 24 plus minus one. But if this were to be dynamically reset to 20 to 30, then you can see that a lot of the time you could get 100% fresh air and still manage without paying an energy price for this air conditioning. Uh, this has been designed by Modgill and I think he'll talk about some of these issues in a later talk. There is also radiant cooling. Now radiant cooling is a cooling which uh, our Danish uh, researcher with a bad haircut had worked out. Our human skin is significantly more sensitive to radiant fields, that is to say, this is the reason why at minus 20 in a place like Ladakh, in the sun, we can feel warm because the sun is falling on our skin and the mean radiant temperature is not that low. It's not minus 20. The mean radiant temperature might even be plus five or plus 10 because of the fact that the sun is radiating heat onto your skin. Our human skin is significantly more sensitive to cool spaces for this reason. It's also significantly more sensitive to warm sources. So it's easier in um, winter climates such as in Europe. So you have radiators which even though in very small areas have a high enough temperature that they can transfer a lot of heat to humans and therefore without heating the room they can heat the human beings inside. Similarly in, um, in a reversal of that process you can have structural cooling or radiant cooling and this is a particular building being made in Gurgaon, which is nearly ready now. I think because of the lockdown, it couldn't get completed. Now in that red looking little picture on the central top, you see how the radiant pipes are being laid out. They have chilled water at much higher temperatures circulating inside so that the slabs are cool. And on the diagram on the upper left, you see how people basically have a cool floor to work with, also a cool ceiling incidentally. And therefore, the amount of air conditioning demanded is very, very strongly reduced. And uh, it also, this particular building has been designed with the uh, openable windows so that you can let in fresh air during better times of the year. And there will definitely be better times. This is the Fanger's equation uh, of something called TO, which is T operative, which is the similar to the temperature that we feel in terms of comfort which should be equal to ta ambient temperature which is measured by the mercury thermometer plus t mrt mean radiant temperature uh, which means the temperature that would be measured by a brass globe painted black which would sum up the effect of all the sources of heating and cooling in radiant fashion around in this uh, space so um, so this average of ambient and mean radiant temperature is used as the operative temperature and this has been increasingly used now and after i think the covid uh, issues of uh, central air conditioning being problematic this will be used increasingly because most european air conditioning engineers work with operative temperatures and i think the only reason why american air conditioning engineers worked with ambient temperatures was that a lot of the science was developed in Florida which has overcast skies and is just warm and humid all the time therefore ambient there are no real sources of mean radiant temperatures which are very different from ambient therefore it was easy enough T0 
was roughly equal to ta and therefore it would not matter one last point that i do want to make is that uh, there is such a thing as task lighting a lot of you would know that of course the simplest version is this little uh, lamp that uh, you have on your desk which gives you light therefore does not require the ceiling to have as much light that you might otherwise require if you did not have these lamps and this has been used increasingly in offices to reduce the amount of lighting but similarly we can have task fans and when you have task fans you can have an individual fan which traditionally air conditioning industry used to discourage the use of fans because they said well air movement on your face is not good it will cause you um, to get a cold and so on but i think we've started increasingly realizes that realizing that if the temperatures are 28 and 29 it makes sense to start using fans to pump in locally recirculated air agreed admittedly and on the right you see a diagram of a building where it was planned but not implemented yet to have task lights and task air conditioning uh, the fresh air that came in from the floor in this case could vary from 10 to 100 percent this is the same building that i showed you before and uh, uh, that that is the reason why uh, you can actually save a lot of energy because you can create a cool bubble around you instead of having very large quantities of air being uh, circulated for cooling just corridors and circulation spaces and places which are not used often and so on so forth so i'm saying that in summary that uh, although there is a sense of uh, not really giving up on air conditioning altogether but making more sensible versions of it so that you recognize for it for the valuable and energy intensive uh, service that it is it's possible to have a large amount of technical solutions whether it is radiant cooling or fresh air based cooling you even have the classical um, uh, evaporative cooling which uh, pumps in 100 percent fresh air and is very useful for dry hot climates uh, for example in Jeddah, uh, where we were designing so we could look at that as well and therefore um, you don't need to just go with uh, standardized air conditioning solutions, but we need to think this out from first principles all over again, especially in these times. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Tanmay Tathagat now to take over and then to Mott Gill, who will make more technical aspects of this seminar. There I am. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, Namaskar. It's uh, good to have uh, the speakers now have all set up all the fundamentals of uh, what uh, the response to uh, the issues of air conditioning, comfort, energy use in our buildings especially in our cultural context and a lot of it uh, is uh, first principles as sp said it's something that people have uh, intrinsically understood and we have had designed responses on uh, each one of these issues in in several buildings what is interesting is despite us having this uh, this common sense and wisdom 
and all the technology that we have currently for air conditioning, uh, are we really comfortable? Are we, forget about the overall environmental context of, you know, where uh, the impact of air conditioning is, is it even achieving what it is supposed to do as it is designed right now? So I would like to ask you a few questions. Uh, there will be a, a couple of questions appearing on your screen. And it'll be great if you can just click on it, select your response, and uh, we'll move on to the next one. Each poll will be on for uh, about a minute. So here's the first one. How has been, how has your experience been with thermal comfort in air conditioned buildings such as offices, restaurants, malls so far? So just select an option on the screen and uh, let's run it. So is it that you often feel you're too hot or is it too cold in those buildings or it's all right for uh, most of the time uh, or you're comfortable but you feel claustrophobic or stuffy uh, which is indication of uh, poor ventilation and things like that uh, so select your option uh, we have another 10 uh, 10 seconds to go before we move on to the next one Okay, this is very, very interesting. So I'm closing the poll. Now. Deepa, can you hear me? I'm not able to close the poll. Can you yeah, do that I'm, for me, please? Yes. Can you close this poll, please? Yes, it's Great. closed now. Great. Uh, so, can we see the results now? Or wait, wait. Let me. Let's not see the results now. Can we see all the results in the end? Sure, you can see it in the end. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next question. The next poll question. Could you please launch the next poll? It's launched. It's on the screen. The poll is launched. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So how often do you wish you could open the windows to be more comfortable but cannot? due to noise, pollution, mosquitoes, etc. So very often, sometimes I don't face any problem in opening my windows. It's closed. Uh, no, oh, one second. Can we? Yes. Uh, but th is this still open or closed now? It's closed, right? It is closed at the moment. Okay. Uh, we can move right. to the next one. Yeah. So let's hide these results. Let's go to the next one. How often do you wish that you could open the windows, but you cannot because they're not operable? How often does that happen? That they are either fixed windows or there are no windows around you, uh, uh, or uh, they're just too difficult to operate and you have to call someone to operate the windows or they're not accessible or obstructed. Uh, and we are again talking about 
uh, not your home necessarily in this case. Uh, a lot of focus this year is on uh, your commercial buildings, offices, and other spaces. So uh, let's run this for another 10, 20 seconds. And if you're, uh, if you never felt like opening the windows uh, and they've been accessible, you select rarely there. Wow, we've got good response here. Okay, uh, so I close the poll here. Deepa, can you please close the poll and show the next one? Next. I'll launch the next one. Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the next one is on the screen. Not on my screen yet. If it's in the audience view, can you please read the question, Deepa? Yeah, sure. So the next question is, would you be okay being at a higher temperature setting for saving energy? That would mean uh, yeah. changing your thermostat settings. So let's say all that we discussed that, you know, instead of 22 or 24, uh, is it okay if we change it to 26, 27 or 28 even, or as Ashok is saying 29 with the ceiling fan where he is right now, uh, would you be interested or willing to do that for saving energy or cost uh, or for, uh, reasons of environment, global warming. Yes? Okay, great. Yeah. We've got great response here. Can you show the results yeah. here? Okay, no, let's not show the results. Let's go to the last question. Quickly get this. Sure. Out. Yes. The last question is now on the screen. The last question is, would you be okay with a higher temperature setting if it makes the space safer? against COVID-19 spread? So, it's the same question as the last one, but if we look at, let's say, the guidance from various organizations at this point of time, that if the humidity is a little more, if the temperature is a little higher, then uh, the particles that come out or uh, that are, uh, dissipated in the air when we speak or talk or sneeze uh, can settle down faster and may help in reducing the spread through airborne uh, method in air conditioned buildings or any building for that matter. Okay, great. Can we just close this and, and see the results now? Yes, so we'll see them one by one, starting from the first question. Yes, we should. Uh, yeah, and for some reason, I'm not able to see these things. So maybe you can read them out for me. I can show the results. Yes, please. So that's the result for poll question number one. Can you see the screen, Tanmay? No, for some reason, I can't see the screen, but will you just go ahead and describe it and so that we move on quickly to the next one. Yeah. Sure. So, first question was, how has your experience been with thermal comfort in air-conditioned buildings such as offices, restaurants, and malls? And 41% of attendees say they often feel too cold, followed by 31% who say that comfortable but stuffy, and then 26% saying I'm mostly comfortable. And a very small percentage 2% are saying that they feel so too hot. Oh, so most of the time, 40% of the time, you're too cold. Okay, next. Yeah. That's right. In the next question, 
uh, I think this is where we kind of didn't get most of the responses, but still uh, we can read what we've got. How often do you wish you could open the windows to be more comfortable, but cannot due to noise, pollution, mosquitoes, etc. 80% says more very often, followed by 15% says sometimes, and then 5% for I open my windows irrespective. Great. And the third question. How often do you wish you could open the windows, but you cannot because they are not operable? 41% of attendees are saying sometimes, followed by 34% saying very often, and 25% rarely. Great. Next one, please. Okay. Next one. Yeah, next one's on the screen. Would you be okay at a uh, being at a higher temperature setting for high for saving energy? 58% uh, people said yes, mostly yes, and 42% saying mostly no. And the last one? And the last one. The last one's the same question, but it is in context of being safe against COVID-19 spread. 93% of people says no, yes. 7% <laughs> <laughs> saying no. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, so, and you know, this is interesting because we have a large number of people there. So, and we have had large number of responses. We've got over, like for the last one, we had 70% of the people responding out of uh, 1,500 odd who are 15, 1600 who are there at this point of time. So it's a fairly representative sample, of course, of people who are, I guess, in a way already in the business and are environmentally aware. But, uh, uh, you know, let's close this and let's move on with the presentation now. So this sets the context of uh, what ails the, the design, uh, the, the uh, construction, operations of uh, buildings and air conditioning systems uh, and not just in india it's a it's a concern that uh, is uh, is a global concern uh, and we can clearly see that there is a there is an answer in the questions that we just asked so is there a way we can uh, be more comfortable and save energy the answer is yes because you know most people are feeling too cold uh, most people can't open their windows and they would like to. Uh, most people are okay if they look at air conditioning uh, from a comfort perspective, from a health perspective, rather than looking at it just as a balance of uh, energy. So it also means how we communicate our thoughts and our, uh, 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 our suggestions about uh, energy or environment to the people who, who take such decisions. So I see that, you know, in this current context uh, with this focus on comfort and air conditioning gives us an opportunity to re-look at this debate. And a lot of this context has been provided in the previous discussion. So let me just uh, launch into the presentation, keep it short, uh, and I'll just summarize some of the key thoughts that have, uh, uh, that have been presented earlier. And move on to what can be done. So, Sunday, yeah. camera is frozen. Do you want to switch on and switch, switch off and switch it on again? Better, uh, better now? Uh, I'm, I'm yet to see the uh, cam. It's all right. So I, I think for ease, uh, for better quality of audio, I would just close that for now. Okay. Okay. So uh, just to summarize our understanding of thermal comfort. Uh, are we feeling too hot, too cold, too sweaty or stuffy? That feeling is what comfort is. 
uh, it has been a challenge to put it in in uh, metrics and in terms of uh, engineering uh, and therefore this is one of the few definitions that says it's a condition of the mind how often do you see a scientific standard or a technical standard being defined as a condition of mind and it's a condition of mind which expresses satisfaction with the environment and it's a subjective evaluation and the factors of those subjective evaluation have been uh, those six factors were discussed earlier and we'll present again so to understand this uh, in terms of what it means for our current situation with environment energy and the and the pandemic is to understand human psychology how people behave how they behave uh, at home how do they behave in public spaces and offices and what are their expectations so as long as we can get that satisfaction in their mind uh, a lot of this uh, other physical uh, manifestations are linked to that so you have to maintain the body temperature and the body is constantly trying to exchange heat and to be in this balance uh, so if you can look at it like a piece of equipment that's interacting with its surrounding and producing energy releasing energy and it needs to be uh, in balance uh, and thermally to be comfortable we do have conduction convection radiation and evaporation we've seen these work in our in our uh, surroundings when we sit on a cool surface, you're suddenly cold. People like to sleep on the floor. Uh, my dog right now chooses to sleep on the floor. He's sitting next to me because that's the most comfortable, cool place in the house. It's the floor because it's cooler. That's conduction. Convection is, of course, what we feel mostly in air-conditioned buildings where there's cold or hot air that's blowing through our skin. Radiation is the most uh, uh, least understood in terms of design and our buildings but this is something we experience most often where so many offices so many commercial spaces where you would have a comfortable spot which is cool only in front of a air conditioner or a diffuser but rest of the places are not comfortable even though temperature may be not uh, all right because the surfaces are too hot and this is uh, uh, something that you experience the moment you walk into an old fort or a palace. The, it's the same air. There are no closed spaces in an in a old fort, let's say you walk into in the middle of summer in, in Jaipur. Uh, but the surrounding walls have not heated up. So they're still comfortable. The moment you walk in, you feel that comfort, even though it's the same hot air that's gushing in that was outside and the moment you get, that's radiation. And that's an effect that uh, most buildings can create easily. Finally, evaporation, of course, which is a sensation across our skin, needs air movement so that we can naturally lose our heat and be comfortable. So the factors that affect our sensation and this feeling, temperature, radiation, air movement, relative humidity, clothing, and metabolic rate, have been discussed in great detail. What is in our control, uh, our air temperature, radiation, air motion, relative humidity, clothing and metabolic rate is what the occupants will experience, uh, will have and can take a decision on. But there's also to understand that metabolic activity varies across uh, population. So uh, it is measured as a heat generated by the body. It is expressed as a power density as so many watts per square meter and uh, the unit is met. Now, uh, the, uh, the definition of comfort by all the people that have, been, uh, that have uh, uh, tried to address it so far, always bases it on a survey, on a feeling, and there is always a cutoff point in a survey, right? It is, so for most of the standards, it is a point where 80% of the people will feel comfortable. Now the 20% of the people can be uncomfortable or may be uncomfortable because of several reasons. Some of them are in our control. So temperature, radiation, air movement, uh, clothing, yes. And metabolic rate is very often in nobody's control. So there are 
uh, people who will always be uh, too hot or too cold depending on them but that number statistically is a very very small number so if we are able to balance that rest of the factors in that range uh, you leave with a very small number of people who who really have a metabolic uh, condition which makes them uncomfortable and for that there are solutions now there are individual cooling there are things that you can do at, at a desk or at one spot or a corner but you know going forward that is not the most cost effective or the most viable option that you create these pods and you know what happens when you move away from it do you carry it with you is it like a bubble is it just one spot in your desk and you expect it to stay there the whole time if you want to be comfortable no so it has to be a specific solution for certain number of people who really have the challenge because it's uh, it's not in their control but rest of the things with good egg, good design of and good thoughtful design of buildings and cooling systems or heating systems one can really achieve a higher than 80 percent uh, uh, comfort for uh, uh, higher than 80 percent number of people who are comfortable so when we look at the comfort zone and this 80 percent principle that these boundaries are not absolute they vary with culture health time of the year clothing and physical activity so if we look at our uh, anecdotal uh, uh, evidence i would say of the uh, adaptation that people have the adaptability they have and we had when we were young or when the older generation was young where people could sleep and live without air conditioning a lot of it was adaptation and that's something that is cultural and individual a lot of thermal comfort issues are related to what our expectations are so the air conditioning systems respond to that and the energy the cost of energy is a is a secondary factor it comes in only later because at that moment your expectation when you're in a building is to meet your optimum requirement so the ASHRAE standard has this upper and a lower band which is quite wide as we discussed it's from 18 degrees to 27 degrees in a standard air conditioning building so but there are many times of the year when the outdoor conditions are favorable that means you don't really need anything to be within that 21 to 27 degree range uh, and if you add air movement and fan then the standard says you can go up to two degrees plus or minus and be more comfortable as well so 27 can be 29 and in a ceiling fan number of hours that it can meet that requirement in most climates even in warm and humid uh, or coastal climates is quite large and, and i'll show you an example about that later so do we stick do we need to stick to these temperature conditions through the year and why do we have this difference between the standard comfort model and an adaptive comfort model i mean aren't we all adaptable and adaptive in any case <clears throat> when this thermal comfort model allows us even scientifically to say that as the outdoor temperature goes up we are okay to be in a higher temperature and humidity condition as long as a lot of other things are in control radiant temperatures and control the air flows in control then why don't we do that as a standard comfort model so if you do that consciously and not look at it you know there's two different options it goes a long way ensuring that we have a balance between cooling and energy efficiency how do you design for that one of the approaches we've taken in several of our projects is take any climate and we can just look at five parameters that we look at temperature humidity radiation or uh, uh, cloudiness uh, air uh, wind movement and ground temperature in some cases if i look at these five parameters i can divide the uh, year in several segments in this case i think this was for ahmedabad uh, i guess i don't remember now but you could say that the year was had seven segments uh, december january were cold february was all right march was getting march and april getting slightly warmer may june uh, warm and dry july august warm and uh, humid september october comfortable again and uh, november cool and nice 
So uh, if I divide the year in these segments, then we study these parameters. And for each of these segments, there has to be a distinct architectural and a design response, a way of achieving comfort through passive means. That means you know, with very little energy. So I would say uh, evaporative cooling will be in that segment. Uh, fans of various kind will be in that segment. Architectural solutions will be in that system. And then finally, what is remaining can be met through an technology, cooling technology in active systems and figuring out what's the least energy I can use to achieve that comfort. An example, again, don't try to read through this. This is just an example that with, with the previous example, climate segment one, we say, okay, architectural uh, in element says, insulation on wall and roof is required because it gets too cold at night. And the, but the ground temperature is high, so therefore earth air tunnels might work. And if we use a solar greenhouse in this weather in December, January, we may trap some heat during the day that can heat up the space. If all of this fails, then we can use some conditioning. And there are energy efficient technologies like ground source heat pump or uh, solar heat collectors, or underflow, all kinds of things that are possible that in this case, in this priority, if those things fail, uh, we have uh, as a backup. Uh, next segment, February, temperatures are a little better, uh, sky cover. So, you know, you analyze each segment and see what the response would be. Uh, February, uh, insulation is recommended but not required, etc., etc. All of this translates into a design response and we feel that our building should come with this operations manual, which is, of course, you know what people think a BMS should do, but that's not what it is. BMS is only controlling one part of it, and if we go into excessive automation, we feel that people then they just note, uh, uh, you know, the the results have so far in most buildings uh, been not satisfactory. Uh, so in the future, there will be an opportunity where a situation where everything is automated and working perfectly, but in a way, when you hand over a building or when you take over a building, it needs to come with an operations manual that how do I operate this building and not just the air conditioning system to meet this intent of the design and to be comfortable through the year. This example for a project, it's a commercial project in Mumbai. We looked at actual weather data. We said, okay, the highest maximum temperature in 50 years was 42.4, 20 years was this, and 10 years is this. Highest annual expected in a typical design year is 38 degree. If I say that there are certain hours I can be outside this range, that means I can live with uh, uh, a condition where maybe a few hours I'm, I'm all right, then I have the Worst case condition in March, where my outside temperature is 37.2 and the wet bulb is 21.6, or in monsoon, where it's quite humid, where the dry bulb is low, but the wet bulb is extremely high. That means my it's very humid. So, you know, if I look at the worst case condition, as it is, you can see, people tend to over-design. I could have chosen 42 degrees and said, okay, you know, I'm designing everything for 42 degrees, but, you know, that is the worst case condition may happen once in 50 years. So even starting off is where do you dis start designing for comfort is the first point after you've done the passive. Then you look at, okay, this is a chart that shows relative humidity on the y-axis and the dry bulb temperature on the x-axis. This is the distribution for Mumbai for all the hours in the year. And here we can see that when the temperature is low, below 27, 28, it's comfortable with ventilation and air movement. There's the other segment where the temperature is high, it goes up to 37, 38, but my relative humidity is below 65. In this, if I have good thermal mass, which is not too hot, in fact, it should be cool, and air movement, most of the people will be comfortable. That leaves us this segment where the temperature may be over 28 degrees and the humidity is over 65 condition, 
certain amount of mechanical cooling will be required. And this is a general climatic analysis of outdoor conditions. Indoor conditions are actually moderated by a lot of these things. So the actual number of hours in which you need cooling will be a subset of this mechanical cooling required. So what does a building need to do? First of all, the building needs to make sure that the inside conditions are never worse than outside. I mean, that's like a no brainer. First step. Then you've achieved this condition. Then in the condition in which mechanical cooling is required, we are looking at a small segment where now you've moderated some through passive, through uh, architecture, and then some cooling is done. So on a monthly basis, this is what it looks like. The, sorry. Admitting. Yes, sir. Admitting. We are running very late. Yeah, so I'm done. Request you to yeah. speed up and then. Yes. We will have so, no time left questions yes so this translates into a heat map that uh, yeah where you can plot these things and see what strategies would work and what the energy impact of those would be through the year there are codes and standards that address this so ecbc has a provision for both commercial and residential buildings that talks about efficiency standards, insulation, window and shading that are directly related to comfort. So meeting those again directly translates into better comfort and energy. And the final thing is choosing the most energy efficient technology, even with standard cooling. Here's an example of two cases. The red bars are before and the green bars are after of actually replacing with better technology. And you can see there's a savings that go up to 30 to 70 percent in each case. In response to COVID-19, there's a better awareness of IQ. All the guidance says that, you know, across from maintaining distance between people and disinfecting surfaces being the two biggest things, we need better ventilation for dilution, which means there is an opportunity to increase outside air, which means there's an opportunity to do free cooling, as it is called or an economizer mode. Higher temperatures and humidity for finer particles to settle down and not recirculate, that means is an opportunity to also play on adaptive thermal comfort along with IAQ. There are filtrations that are for catching pathogens. Now, these are not proven yet. There's a lot of uh, uh, div division in what it does, but at the very least, what it can do is catch dust and improve air quality inside the spaces. And the last mm -hmm. bit is disinfection of air conditioning components and surfaces. This again is, uh, is a good practice for coils and a few other areas, but for moving air, it's very difficult to move, uh, to disinfect moving air through any of these common things like UV uh, because the exposure time is not there. And finally, all the mechanical engineering associations and societies are also advocating daylighting and natural ventilation in fact the uh, the guidance for opening of airports now says that all the airports in india should be operated uh, naturally ventilated so that's what we need to do and the final thing is looking outside the buildings designing for urban heat island mitigation like in iit jodhpur we designed uh, the buildings to be shaded rejuvenating water bodies so unless the outside is comfortable a lot of things we talked about today where people were opening windows and things could not do. So how do you balance this? One, everything is climate specific, contextual, pragmatic balance and adaptation. The way we are going right now, we're moving towards, and we already are, I am addicted to this concept of air conditioning, but we have to go back to our uh, adaptation model. And these are possible uh, now. So the integrated approach for adaptation, design, and efficient technology is the key to managing the metric of comfort, health, and energy use. Thank you. Back to you, Vinod.
नमस्कार बेसिकली माई जॉब इज मेड वेरी इजी बाई ऑल द थ्री प्रेजेंटर्स हु प्रेजेंटेड बिफोर मी अशोक वेरी नाइसली डिफाइन हाउ and why we need air conditioning and how we came and traveled up to this point and why we traveled whereas uh, sanjay talked about orientation and various other uh, passive measures as well as some active uh, measures as well tanmay described in a very great detail about uh, air conditioning as well as uh, why and when we should have that let me start with that uh, our ancestors very well recognized the benefit of evaporative cooling <clears throat> and that was based on the principle of human body functions how it functions when the blood temperature rises the blood flow increases towards the skin and evaporative cooling starts the sweating happens and evaporative cooling starts and body temperature or blood temperature starts slowing down this is what is the natural phenomena which is being developed by god in our body and the same principle was being utilized by our ancestors to create shelters which were based on the principle of breathing buildings breathing buildings means the buildings which used to breathe every material every construction material need to breathe and most of the places we do find the moisture is a big issue <clears throat> so you know till the time air doesn't move on any surface or any place or any closed place we create or any shaft closed shaft we create which is not ventilated moisture is going to get trapped out there so the simple principle of breathing building is that allow the material to absorb moisture from the air when it is excess in the air and release the moisture when it is less in the air so now the principle which i am basically going to describe here is that how to make our shelters which can be livable based on the principle of human mechanism now before i come to that let us understand what and how was the building architecture before air conditioning was invented by wells carrier wells carrier was the first who invented the air conditioning and our building structures used to look like this what is shown in this uh, slide but what happened when we got the air conditioning system so building architecture after air conditioning was perfected by engineers just transformed to these kind of glass houses which uh, can be called as solar cookers by uh, few architects so why did we do that now let's go back what was the basic principle and how we are comfortable our skin temperature is almost 36 degree and even tanmay uh, ashok and uh, sanjay described that what is mean radiant temperature or global mean temperature or how comfort is derived so you see what happens is when we put a glass which is west or southwest exposed and try to cut heat to that then that glass has to absorb some heat before it cuts out or reflects out so the temperature of that that glass can reach at times to 65 degree celsius or between 55 to 65 which is pretty high so that radiant temperature sitting next to us makes us uncomfortable i will give you an example our cars uh, high end cars when we get into the car it immediately starts it's a full blast of air and 
Do you know what is the temperature of air at that point? The supply air temperature is four degrees Celsius, which is killing for a human body. But because the radiant heat is pretty so high that we cannot be comfortable without that. So the temperature of air we keep very low. Now, instead of getting into these kind of uh, temperatures or these kind of artificial this thing, why don't we create surface temperature of the skin of the space where we live? So as our body blood circulates to the skin and keeps it comfortable through evaporative cooling why can't we make breathing buildings which can be like that so let us look into this how we can achieve that so let's see if we want to create a building let's have these uh, walls so how do we put it so we put some thermal mass into the wall then we need one layer which has to be impervious so as not to allow the moisture to get into the inside of the surface or into the building construction materials. Then what we do is we put some hygroscopic material which can uh, take some kind of uh, moisture, breathing material, which can take moisture when moisture content in the air, ambient air is high and release that moisture. So what will happen? That this will try to keep to the wet world temperature. Now, let us understand the wet world temperature. Wet world temperature during the time when three o'clock maximum outdoor air temperature, dry valve is highest, wet valve is lowest. And at night time, that wet valve increases, although the dry valve is much lower at that point because the heating effect makes the wet valve lower. So the humidity is minimal at, a, at around 3 a.m. in the 3 p.m. in the summer. So this is the principle on which we should basically utilize this. <clears throat> now, in addition to that, what we can do is we can add certain bodies, water bodies, and some greenery on the northern side to pick the air from the north which is much cooler because already Sanjay explained that. So I will not go into that details because of paucity of time. So that moist air, we have to create a kind of microclimate around the building and allow that air to come in contact with the external layer of the building, which acts as a breathing layer and keeps on absorbing and releasing the moisture and stay close to wet world temperature and keep the inside space surface temperatures also close to wet world temperatures. Now, uh, once we, if we want to put the glass onto one side or generally whatever we want to, you see, uh, if we consider the external uh, ambient levels of 10,000, 11,000 lux, then we don't need more than two to 3% of the glazing to have daylighting if the orientation and the style or design of the building is good. But anyhow, if we, even if we want to put more, then we have to be sure that this temperature of this surface should not be higher. So how to do that? We can have an external layer, a jali kind of thing put outside that. So that jali can provide a view, but at the same time, completely prevent external solar directly getting onto the surface of the glass. So the solar gain is cut, then the temperature of that glass is going to be close to the whatever surface temperature we have of this material, which is jali, which can also be hygroscopic breathing material. So this is the principle which we should utilize even for COVID times also, this is very good. Now, we need certain kind of air also for breathing. So, but before I got onto that, uh, although Sanjay explained, but I would like to spend some time here that there are two factors, one insulation and another thermal mass. What insulation does? 
insulation basically builds the time lag it shifts if my peak is at uh, it will be better in the next slide if my peak summer temperature is at 3 pm then i may shift it to 7 8 9 10 pm i don't know how many of us have stayed in iim ahmedabad hostel but whosoever has stayed he will find that 10 pm at night the maximum heat comes in because the thermal mass in the hostel portion is so heavy that it takes seven to nine hours to reach the maximum external temperature to inside next that doesn't mean the same temperature it is uh, temperature but the highest temperature which is attained in unconditioned room at night is around 10 to 11 pm so what we do is we try to dampen decrease the temperature by thermal mass as well as build the time lag so thermal mass does both the things it builds the time lag and it is adjustable time lag whatever we want how many hours we want we can accordingly choose our materials second we can do the damping the maximum time lag is there the maximum damping is there because the outside temperature has to reach inside it has to pass through various layers and by the time it reaches inside it is going to get reduced drastically so we have to choose the materials construction materials in a way that our average temperature remains in the comfort zone and then accordingly we can choose our occupied and unoccupied timings now this is one project where uh, the similar strategies were utilized this is a bhuvaneshwar rishi bhavan now these are the local materials local material bricks which are used as the inside is in complete glass but this is a shading so this is the kind of jali which was thought of and finally this is what came in so these were the glass windows but we utilize this perforated jali to allow for the this the light to perforate in now while we choose the materials we have to be selective here laterite was available in plenty so what we did that in the north side we created garden and water bodies and all created a stilt south side we closed a courtyard is made here also we created some green and water bodies and allowed the air to rise up so this was basically to create a microclimate around the building so as to allow this building to come close to the wet wall temperature throughout so the surface temperatures remain close to wet bulb. Now, how did we get the air into there? So we had thought of using the hollow core slab, which basically should have taken the air through the slab and up, as well as we utilized intakes at lower level. And then at the higher level, the exhausts were put, but every floor exhaust and room exhaust with separate shafts because of the stack effect because stack effect has to make shafts bigger intake bigger or smaller because of this so what we did that we did not combine the shafts otherwise it affects the upper floors so what we did was that we kept the shaft separate and allowed this to go up and then use these ventilators on top now uh, these were kind of sensors which were used. I will just, uh, sorry. These were the sensors which were used. So uh, this was the intake louver, a filter at the back, and then actuator and damper. Now this actuator is controlled by this temperature sensor, which is an ambient temperature sensor, and based on this it takes reference from the inside global mean temperature mean radiant temperature of the space and based on this difference it decides 
how much to open. At night time, mostly it opens 100%. And during daytime, it comes to certain percentage where we can have CO2 level maintained at that point. So this is how it is done. And then this is the external uh, grill and then the fan up. Now, uh, see, okay, so uh, this is, these are the sensors which we use, fresh air inlet, ambient temperature sensor, filters are there with fresh air inlet, and turbo air ventilators, mean temperature sensors, exhaust air grills, and fresh air dampers with actuators. So these were basically used there. And then on the basis of that, we uh, had uh, done this. Now, one another thing, which is a kind of uh, exhaust based on stack effect can be used as a solar chimney and no need to have any kind of fans. This because of the uh, heat and stack effect gets created because of the thermal uh, differences, temperature differences, it automatically uh, gets uh, pumped up. Now, now evaporative cooling. This is a project which is Shakti Bhavan and this entire place, if you look into all buildings are of, uh, office complex these these are the air washer rooms these are not the pad air washers these are uh, spray type air washers which are being used here and all these uh, air washers keep these areas cool so this is centrally evaporative cooled entire complex and almost 46 40000 cfm air washers have been used for this entire complex to it keep it cool. So it's uh, in today's uh, scenario, if we look at, then we can uh, find that this is uh, a kind of technology which will be more suited for COVID kind of application. Now, uh, Sanjay talked about earth air tunnel. I will only like to add one thing. We use this one residential application somewhere in 1984 for the first time uh, for two scientists who are NASA, who were NASA based couple, and uh, they wanted to have this. So, but we used it in a recirculatory mode. Uh, only fresh air was being introduced through this area, but otherwise, the fan was supplying this through a vertical shafts and those vertical shafts had the dampers with actuators controlled as soon as somebody switches on the split ACs. That was first time the carrier had come out with split ACs, which we use there. So as soon as they switch on the split AC, this will shut off. The damper will cut off the supply. But let me just tell you why this was thought of at that point was for the simple reason that they said that they said that uh, they want to have comfortable temperature throughout the house so that's how we designed this and then once we checked they said uh, uh, we can uh, basically uh, <clears throat> So now, uh, when we come to the air conditioning systems, how can we save energy into air conditioning systems? See, air conditioning systems consume energy that all of us know. But if we look into the uh, chillers, already ECBCs, Tanmay described, that takes care even pumps, cooling gas, and uh, all those uh, equipments which consume energy, the 
limitations, efficiencies, and COPs have been specified, but air fan system efficiency has not been uh, covered under that because that is left to the system designer and system designer can use. Now, because the air handling units fans keep on running throughout and mostly at uh, constant uh, speed because of the requirement whether we need 2% cooling or 20% cooling, even if we use VAV fans, we have to do this. So what kind of technologies can be utilized there to reduce this portion of 31%? Uh, yeah. Now, options to reduce fan energy consumption. We can we have the possibility to use underfloor air distribution, radiant floor, or chilled beams. Now, if we take a normal building, generally 30 meters square per ton of refrigeration is the load, which makes 117 watts per meter square. So if we use underfloor air distribution, 100% of this can be uh, taken care of. But if we take radiant floor, only 30% of this or 35% of this can be taken care of. If we use chilled beams, 40% of this can be taken care of. Now, what to do with 60, 65, 70% of the rest? That because one more thing in these two radiant and chilled beams, only sensible heat can be taken off. It's, there is no possibility that we can uh, uh, avoid this. So this sensible heat uh, has to be basically uh, once taken off, then latent heat has to be taken out through direct outside air system which has got a penalty of high fan power because that has to be located somewhere close to outside. So that is what one disadvantage this has. And uh, let's take what is uh, underfloor air distribution system and how it works. So uh, we supply the air through the uh, false floor, which is underfloor supply plenum. And then there are grills or diffusers which uh, release the air at a very low velocity. And then we use this portion as mixed zone. Here the air mixing takes place. Air is left at the bottom level and then it rises with the heat source. So whether human or occupant or computer or anything that allows this to rise. So what happens is but wherever they get heat source, from there, the air starts rising up because warm air tends to go up and then it goes up. And this becomes then the stratified zone where there is air movement is only because of the heat sources. So this is how underfloor air distribution utilized. This utilizes low fan bar because this plenum, which is underfloor supply plenum, uses very low fan static pressure. That because air velocities are very high, so they need a lot more power to compensate for the friction losses. Here we use very low uh, fan bar. Now, radiant floor and ceiling with direct outside air system, these are, as I already explained, if we use both ceiling and uh, floor, then we are able to get it to 65%. But here, if we go to 50 meters square per TR, we have to design the building in a manner that it has to be highly efficient. Envelope has to be very, very efficient so as to uh, cater for this. So 35% of still has to be covered by the external layer. So this is what uh, DOS system has to take care of. And in active chilled beams with uh, DOS, this is again, if we go with 50 meters square per TR, then 35% has to be covered by external and 65% by internal. One advantage, more advantage in all these three systems is 
that the chiller temperature can be much higher so energy saving in chiller is much higher because we are running at a higher temperature so this is how we basically uh, do that so now only one slide is left this is basically the concrete cooling with the hollow core slab so what happens here is that we supply the air through these cavities and cool the slab as well as supply some pressure whatever is required for uh, or to compensate for the latent heat uh, removal of latent heat this is the system which is used this is also basically avoids any kind of uh, all these systems have got high uh, inertia and they don't allow much of the temperature variations so temperatures are quite stable in these thank you i will uh, hand over to vinod thank you again uh, there was uh, we have kind of overrun time but I think it's nice that everyone was able to have his or her say fully. So we have time for a few questions and I will ask Deepa to tell us what are these most important three, four questions that we can take up in the time that's left to us. Or maybe if there is more time, we can do perhaps more. So Deepa, all yours. Sure, we have a lot of questions actually. So let's get started with it right away. First question is, most passive ventilation measures like earth berms, wind tunnels, etc. are talked about for dry, arid climate. What are the passive ventilation measures which can be used in hot and humid climate? Who's going to answer that one? Uh, I could attempt that, even though my webcam is not visible. Yeah. Uh, see, it's surprising that this question is asked because in a warmer, humid climate, ventilation is the common strategy for passive cooling anyway. This is why most of Goa's houses, barring the five-star hotels, don't actually have air conditioning, but are designed to be very well ventilated. This is also why um, so many buildings in the south happily manage without air conditioning. So I think generally the stress has been on uh, ventilation. Yes, it's true that if you want to reduce humidity, there is very little um, choice but to go for some kind of a uh, mechanical system but the reduction of humidity as Tanmay also showed in one of his graphs for Bombay is not required all the time. Our problem is that we end up uh, setting up an air conditioning system and then because it can also work in the lower humidity times we just end up using it at those times. So that, that's really the, the greater problem. Not so much the fact that uh, these passive uh, ventilation measures are applicable for warm, dry periods only, hot, dry periods only. Okay, Deepa, next question. Right. Next question, yes. How effective is natural ventilation for high rise buildings? At what point do we consider natural ventilation disruptive? in that case for a very high rise building and may you want to take that one again yeah uh, deepa can you repeat the question yes sure the question is how effective is natural ventilation 
for high rise buildings and at what point do we consider natural ventilation disruptive in that case see uh, as far as uh, natural ventilation is concerned till the time you are able to manage or create comfort through passive measures by using various uh, kind of uh, techniques passive techniques as well as shading orientation thermal mass and all those technologies plus you are able to create that kind of effect it is not that it is not done even if we go to various western uh, or south france or switzerland areas you will find that buildings are designed with natural ventilation even if we look into the federal building of us which is a breathing building that is also naturally ventilated so naturally ventilated building high rise buildings do not have any kind of restrictions with regard to natural ventilation but it's only the way how you design your building how you place your building how to use your materials and other thermal mass and the choice of orientation and massing I think it probably has. Sorry, then I go ahead. Then I go ahead. No, no. I was just saying that there are many uh, contemporary architects and designers in Southeast Asia as well, in Singapore and and Malaysia, who have shown that there are several ways in which high-rise buildings can be naturally ventilated. Uh, so I was. Can I, just, I would like to add to this that. uh you know it also depends upon what kind of building we are talking about residential buildings are typically naturally ventilated even if they are very tall because uh, you know people can choose to open some windows it's more of a problem when you have uh, you know a large uh, air conditioned office buildings in which you know one single individual can create problem for the whole office that is why you know the, the control of windows is not left to individuals so but if you have as as uh, jan had shown that we do have systems in which you can control the uh, ventilation automatically so this would apply to tall buildings as well sanjay you have wanted to add something yeah, i wanted to add that uh, the singapore architect uh, nirmal kishnani has recently made a case study of a very good 25 story central singapore naturally ventilated building in a warm humid climate that really needs to be studied because uh, i mean you know we are sitting in leek kuan use country and uh, still working with a natural ventilated building so that's quite amazing in itself next question deepa right next question is how much does mechanical automation of architectural features for passive design compared to the energy consumption of hvac sure. not very well understood can i read that again yeah how much does mechanical automation of architectural features on buildings for passive design compared to the energy consumption of hvac oh uh, if we look into the hvac <laughs> system if they consume say 100 then these systems which uh, i was trying to explain through my uh, this thing these actuators and all uh, and sensors probably need only uh, 4 to 5% of the energy and even if we consider the fountains and all into that pumping energy maybe maximum 10% of the energy wasn't the question something like this that how much energy can you save by applying the passive principles yeah there would be a simple answer to that or then maybe you can how much can you save by applying the uh, passive principles to air conditioned buildings uh, i can give you uh... a reason yeah. practical examples it's a quick practitioners guess that it would be something between 30 at the very least to 
well, 70%, 80% even, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, Gyan, the building that he showed you from Bhubaneswar, is an office building, a government office building, which would normally have been air-conditioned, but is completely passively ventilated. Uh, so, I mean, barring some uh, cabins for higher officers, which are air-conditioned, but uh, that so that is it's not an impossible task, but it requires a lot of sensitivity and care to be able to do that. The good news might be that uh, with this situation, we might get into the necessity to look at those kind of options rather than blindly just um, provide air conditioning, which, as we all know, has become cheaper and cheaper the more ubiquitous it is. So this this building in Bhubaneswar, yeah, which you have shown. Yeah. That requires nothing special for dealing with COVID-19. No. Everything uh, is all right. In fact, uh, Vinodji, I would like to clarify that air conditioning is not, uh, has got nothing to do with COVID-19 uh, spread. Because air conditioning is a comfort application. If the inside indoor air quality is bad, in other times, it is bad in this time also. If we have certain kind of infection possibilities earlier, it will remain same because the COVID-19 virus, although is a very small virus, it is uh, 0 0.08 to 0 0.16 micron, which is PM 2.5 is 2.5 micron. So it is much smaller than that, but is a heavy virus and try to settle on the surface. So it, till the time we don't uh, try to shake the surface or do something, it remains on the surface. Even if we try to do, it will again settle down. So once we breathe out, if there is some uh, COVID positive person, he will definitely breathe out those particles which can travel longer up to three, three and a half, four meters, depending upon the velocity of the air. If somewhere he is sitting close to even cooler, which is horizontally throwing the air, then he may throw even uh, 10 meters. But if uh, we take air conditioning, except for velocity wise, I don't think anything will come back into the return air because up till now, nowhere in any of the scientific findings or studies or uh, CDC recommendations or WHO recommendations, nothing, nowhere it has been proven that it is airborne. Except for in an hospital application, that too when the patient frequency was at peak, but when it got to normal situation, there also it was found that it got uh, kind of subsidized. So it's not uh, that uh, COVID-19, uh, basically air conditioning, it's a fear which has created, but as Tanmay tried to describe, air conditioning is basically created by us and we are the culprit to create that kind of indoor air quality, which we call bad. If we naturally ventilate our building, if we kind of create some kind of thermal comfort through uh, passive means, then we need not to worry about that, uh, you know, uh, Bastu or our ancestors used to say, wherever light, sun and air can reach, no virus or no bacteria can stay. So this is the principle of this. Okay, Deepa, next question. There is a connecting question with this. For dynamic facades with movable shading elements, how beneficial uh, would the system be to provide comfort versus the energy it takes to operate these systems? I don't think we have discussed any of these moving facades in this uh, this this webinar. So maybe we can move on to the next question. Okay. Gyan, you want to answer that? Uh, he already answered it that it's basically not more than 5 to 10% overall compared to air conditioned yeah. buildings. 
So Especially that's... if you want to move it slowly, which is all you need actually. If you want to move it very rapidly, which is unusual, then of course it would be more than 10%, but uh, it's Almost. very little. Actuators are basically very low energy consumption and uh, we can't move it fast. Otherwise, uh, this is not something uh, rapid uh, with regard to air conditioning that we pump in air or we uh, reduce the air quantity. This is something which is naturally, we are taking advantage of night purge, we are taking advantage of night cooling, or we are reducing this during daytime. So it is only uh, automatically, it is happening at a very low speed. Yeah, yeah. Next question, please. Next question. Yeah. Would you throw some light on passive cooling techniques as a retrofit method for existing buildings? That is case to case based. It can't be generalized. Okay. Next. Next question. I, I think I just like to comment that it is because it is so case to case that it has not found common acceptance because yeah. a lot of people in the marketplace simply want a ready made solution, which, by the way, the air conditioning industry kind of gives, but at a cost. Uh, monetary as well as energy cost, but which uh, the passive design industry cannot give because it is so case specific. I would like to just comment on that. Uh, if you don't look at passive cooling techniques, but if you look at passive techniques to improve the performance of the external envelope of the building, there's a very strong case for retrofit, for controlling uh, insulation of direct and indirect um, radiation onto the glass, reducing the amount of glass, and adding insulation to the building envelope. You can improve the demand for air conditioning because of the reduction in heat influx from the outside yeah. by dealing with the external envelope. And this is one thing which has really not taken off, but is a big potential of all many, many existing buildings that can be improved. Uh, how would I do that? Next question. Right. Next question. Can you give some examples of hygroscopic materials? Mm, laterite is one, earth is soil is one. <laughs> there are various materials which are uh, Basically, even uh, uh, there is a artificial materials which are being uh, produced uh, based yeah. on this, which has got uh, three layers, uh, which I described that one impervious layer and then one hygroscopic material. They get some kind of uh, sand and salt mix materials they are trying to use to impregnate onto the outer surface and make it uh, hygroscopic, which tend to uh, take moisture during uh, excess uh, humidity periods. But everything from earth blocks to a regular brick are highly mm -hmm. hygroscopic if they're used yeah. properly. Uh, there's sufficient an amount of uh, natural materials, uh, earth and mud and brick that can meet this requirement. And lime plaster as well. I think there are many people who will swear by the properties of lime, lime plaster, plaster. Absolutely, lime plaster is, yes. yes. Yeah, that's so, excellent, excellent example, yes. Next, please. Yeah, next question is, uh, concrete has high thermal mass and exposed RCT is becoming a trend these days. Would you please throw some light on its characteristics and functioning in a hot and dry and hot and humid climate? Uh, see, the concrete cooling is another way of thermal storage if we look into on the national level if we go into that then the grid bar peak shaving can be easily done but this has to be uh, on an integrated approach through government mechanism political will as well as the industry which wants to transform towards that but unfortunately there are various factors which are 
greed to political related, which do not allow this to happen. So uh, I would like to stop here only. But otherwise, concrete cooling has got a potential and it can store uh, energy and has been utilized even in Gulf areas. I think the question has something to do with the use of, I suppose, concrete as a walling material on the outer faces of buildings. Um, and yeah. the problem often is that because you want to see the exposed concrete, you don't insulate it from the outside. And so you have a thermal mass um, which heats up a lot and very comparatively high thermal conductivity also. So without insulation, without insulation on the outside, for the sake of seeing the concrete, uh, you are actually inviting the heat in. If you can use it as a big thermal store, but have every insulation on the inside, maybe then you've got a solution. But if you're simply thinking that concrete is being some medic, it's not. It's much worse than a nine inch big wall. Yeah. Next question. Please. Next question. In what ways will post COVID-19 scenario bring about a paradigm shift in the design and overall work culture and challenge this typological norm? I think that this was the question that I had said in my introduction that we would not like to take up. <laughs> but there are many experts on this. Okay. I, I would like to just say one thing about this. Um, that the problem of COVID or the spread of infection is closely related to high density lot of people living in close proximity, working in close proximity. It is also related to the problem of enclosed spaces with trapped air where you can con where where you cannot dilute the infection by using fresh air and you have to uh, necessarily recirculate the air for the sake of keeping the dirty air outside out. Um, so Big implication to my mind is giving up the idea of the big, heavy, heavily developed, high density city form uh, to move to a more sparsely dense or sparsely developed, a relatively low density city form, with which then has generates its own microclimate and can then, you know, like the campus design that we saw in Sanjay's presentation at the beginning. Um, that's the indication for the future. That's a big implication on the whole principle or the pursuit of urbanization and the planning of urban development. That's a big implication that can be taken into account here. But what are we going to do with all the existing building stock that we have, you know? It's not just with COVID-19. I think that there is a very large amount of building stock that doesn't meet basic codes as far as ventilation and lighting are concerned so yeah. and so I, I just wanted to uh, chip in you know that you know we to answer yeah. that question you just said we, we can't really say where it goes and what is the solution but i i just needed to want to express that there is a very uh, clear danger of this taking things uh, in the in the opposite direction because if i look at all the guidance and if someone were to interpret it literally uh, without applying uh, mind, you would have offices and spaces where there is more built up area per person. So you say now <laughs> for a, a thousand person office, I need twice yeah. as much area. It may mean that I am uh, doing designs for air conditioning systems that are now using 100% air conditioning. In fact, this came to us from a query that can we now switch our air conditioning to 100% outside air system which is great, but if you're treating it like a conventional air conditioning system, then you're increasing your energy use for cooling by multiple times. And the third thing is by using heavy filters, which are appropriate for operating rooms for normal spaces, 
where the danger <laughs> for spread and occupants is not high by further increasing the energy use and uh, all of these things if someone takes it literally i don't see very far where real estate companies are going to just advise that this is the norm for now new offices which is because it's a good business for everyone okay so maybe we can take the last question now deepa uh, okay so then we would uh, take this open ended one um, uh, how do we convince people about these aspects the clients of thermal conditioning radiant cooling adapting and changing lifestyle choices how do we convince uh, big corporate clients who are into branding uh, may i say that the five questions that were asked by tanmay and the results of that poll were quite instructive i mean it is amazing to say that um you know we seem to want uh, cooler and colder uh, air conditioning set points but we generally feel uh, too cold uh, that that seem to be the majority view so there is um, there is bound to be this kind of uh, i i call it consumer is thinking until you uh, genuinely get after the issues and uh, anonymously ask people how they are genuinely feeling at various times and various places um, i i don't think uh, customers like to waste money but uh, i think it's just become a success of the air conditioning industry that uh, you try to sell colder and colder places as being better okay to marshal you have to marshal your facts and information in through institutional mechanisms mm -hmm. and really brought make them the norm that is what has to be done over time yeah. individually attempting to convert individuals is rather tough it has to be a cultural shift it has to be managed institutionally but if we if we look to look into the national building code 2016 version it gives us uh, three approaches rather four approaches one for naturally ventilated building 65 cities every month month wise temperatures are specified which are correlated with external temperatures as well as uh, the conditions uh, considering those uh, kind of uh, clothing conditions and then mixed mode buildings and then air conditioned buildings in air conditioning building also two approach air uh, supplier only based approach or air temperature based approach or thermal compression approach so this is uh, basically where the temperature ranges from uh, almost 18 degree to 27.5 degree so this is what the comfort band which is specified and 90% of the people were found comfortable in those ranges even for daily 27.5 degree celsius is specified in the peak summer in air conditioned atmosphere which uh, uh, is not uh, very off than what we were discussing about so i think uh, we are now at the end of this so uh, if the others would like to make a one final statement uh, with all the questions that have been asked or otherwise Ashok, would you like to say something to round off this? Uh, well, this has been quite an educational session for all of us participants, as much as you know the the, the panelists, as much as the participants or the attendees. And I think we've had a very good attendance, and I hope some of the thoughts that have been provoked. uh can begin to multiply and spread through our attendees and let this conversation become more serious sanjay yeah uh i think the the one of the big uh, issues that uh, to some extent the covid crisis has put us up against is uh, what humanity does in order to make money because making money and consumption has become the mantra of our daily life and uh, 
we don't realize the kind of uh, pressures that we put on our natural systems in order to do that in order to be comfortable in order to have the mod cons that we have gotten addicted to and so on and so really speaking it's the the dismantling of the economy that needs to be to my mind it's a very a uh, lofty phrase that i'm using but it's the dismantling of the economy that i feel needs to be in some way attempted so that it's not disruptive but it simply changes the way we value our lives and me uh, i feel that the uh, our design uh, uh, methods and principles that are already well known are enough for us to be able to make uh, this change at this transition there's enough technology and a uh, systemic change can be done can be achieved in a very short period of time when we uh, really all align with the idea that uh, there is a, a crisis which is a, a short term and a long term which can both be addressed with the climate crisis and the pandemic uh, mm. if we are able to just use our first principles uh, in in design and operation of our buildings yeah uh, if we look into uh, this situation you see uh, this has forced us to think uh, backward in the sense that uh, or whatever we have reached or whatever we are being doing till that was that right so uh, if we look into the life of this uh, virus in sunlight and in fresh air outside air the life is shortened so what is basically killing this virus is outside air or the elements which are there in the air which are naturally created by god in the sense that hydrogen peroxide or ozone which are considered as uh, cleaning agents by nature and remain in controlled kind of uh, parameters so that it does not harmful which had been started utilizing by the human greed for internal purpose without any control can be harmful so one aspect is that uh, more of fresh air we people will natural climates people will adapt to more of uh, sunlight which is better plus high humidity which is going to be a kind of a killing factor for this so higher temperature higher humidity outside air these will be the factors but as tanmay said we need to utilize these with care and one more factor which is going definitely going to occur is hospital industry is going to go through a, a quite a bit of change in designs because the requirement of this kind of uh, infections as well as control till the time it is detected is more important in addition to that all those kind of distancing and all which already is there that will remain but in air conditioning these things may happen okay i would like to thank all the four speakers uh, and uh, deepa i have a uh, prachi i have one question are you going to run that poll now or this is uh, for later um the feedback will go to everyone automatically after okay. the session all right so i would like to thank all the four speakers here uh, this be nice and we seem to have an audience that has enjoyed this uh, i would like to thank uh, ebs specially for organizing this work for us on behalf of gubbi uh, and thank deepa and prachi for hosting this thank you all we can end this now okay bye bye thank you bye 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 hey deepa all yours